All righty. Well, welcome to Wednesday. Welcome again, I should say. It's good to have you here. Um, Pastor Ritt and Gail are still on vacation, so I think they're online. So, hey, Pastor Ritt and Gail. And our dear Nicole is online today, so hello, Nicole. Yeah. Glad to have you here. And anybody else that's there by name, I don't know who might be there. I don't, I don't know everybody, but those are the important people in my life, right? All right, so tonight we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we're always plowing through the Bible, doing Bible studies, and sometimes I think we forget about what this book is before us. So if you have a Bible, hold it up. All right, so if I ask you where you got it, what would you say? Uh, yeah, at the store, right? <laughs> or a Christmas present, or you bought it online, or, you know, somebody gave it to you. I got mine this 30, over 30 years in this one, so second cover. But we kind of, kind of, kind of take it for granted, and um, I'm going to reference them, both of them in here, but the Lord pretty much impressed on me to do this study because I needed it. Not because you need it. You probably understand everything I'm already going to say. But I wanted to walk through this, and I found it enormously helpful. So, obviously, uh, the Bible. How do we get it, and can we trust it? Oh, before I forget, uh, sunrise, sunset today, you home Kippur started. So, you, uh, I sent a text to a couple of my Jewish friends, wish them an introspective type of uh, evening. Not that you can tell them... Um, they don't have a temple anymore, so they can't <laughs> make good on all their sins. All right, so here we go. Our Bible, your Bible, is persecution literature written by persecuted believers for the strengthening of other persecuted believers. Is that an amen? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Got to get the hang of all this. All right, so we're going to have a couple of these timelines. I've, if you sit in the back, I'm sorry, it's kind of small, but that's as big as I could make it and still make it cohesive in some manner. So let's just walk through this. So in 1400 BC, that's that first one. You know, Pastor uh, Darren, if I had a pointer, it would be good. 1400 BC, the first written word of God, the Ten Commandments, is delivered to Moses. So here we are, 3421 years later, we're standing before you with the Word of God. Thank you. Mash, Mash it? There it is. Okay. <laughs> you cut it on. Oh, my gosh. All right. Let's get back to it. All right. All right. So in 500 B.C., we have the completion of all original Hebrew manuscripts, which made up the 39 books of the Old Testament. That's pretty amazing in, 500, in that, that short, 900 years. 200, year, 200 B.C., completion of the Septuagint in the, of the Greek manuscripts. Um, this was a twofold um, push by the Lord, if you will. Uh, one, they obviously wanted it, but with the advent of like the Alexandrian Library and things of that nature, they wanted as much of these ancient manuscripts as they could to get into a library. So that was the big push there. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then we have BCAC, all right? This is the demarcation of our calendar system. And even if you want to refute and say there's no God and all those kind of things, everybody still calls it BC and AD, all right? They call it BCE, the before common era type thing. Now they're trying to twist it around, but the bottom line is they're delineating the fact that Jesus was born and Jesus wasn't born, so all right? So they can't get away from it. 500 AD, scriptures have been translated into 500 languages. That's stunning that there are even 500 languages at this time period in the, on the face of the earth, right? 600 AD, Latin was the only language, the only language allowed for scripture. Thank you to the Catholic Church for that. And you would die if you tried to do otherwise, and some people did. We'll talk about that. 1384, Wycliffe, the first person to produce a handwritten manuscript of the complete Bible. 1440, the printing press invented. <clears throat> 1517, Martin Luther's 95 Thesis. If we had not had the printing press, there would have been no Reformation. It just would not have taken place. 
they needed so much in the way of documentation and literature to get out to people to make it worthwhile. They would have never, ever been able to pull off the Reformation without the printing press. They had gone from making three pages a day to over 300 pages a day. And literacy was also an issue at that time, obviously, because not everybody could read or write, even if you were learned. However, some of these men got very creative, and they, I, won't, I won't call them comic books, but they did drawings. So they would tell small biblical stories or doctrine by using little, a little more than stick figures, and they would run those off so they could hand those out to people who couldn't read or write. 1526, Tyndale translates the Greek into, uh, the, into the English New Testament. And in 1560, the Geneva Bible, you've heard of that one before, that's the first English language Bible to add numbers and verses to each chapter. And here we are, 16 AD, the King James printed Bible. Again, this is a huge demarcation in history because everything happens after this. And God is the God of all history. I put that down there because we sometimes forget. We look at this when we're looking at our Bibles in our lap or on maps or such. We get this myopic view of Israel, Egypt, Jordan, the Middle East, and we forget about the rest of the world. There's 23 million square miles of habitable earth. There's more than that if you count the mountain range and stuff, but flat habitable earth, not desert. So there's a lot going on besides what it is we're looking through when we're going through this history. For example, in the Babylonian exile during that time, China, on the other side of the world, was having a huge internal struggle. During David's reign, Japan is in the throes of a dynasty change, and the Mayan culture is just now coming onto the scene. So those are things we don't even think about when we have our Bibles in front of us. There's a whole other world that's out there taking place, evolving as we stand here. All right, so there's King James. Good-looking guy, right? Um, I, don't, I think he's sitting down because that amount of fabric he has on probably weighs about 50 pounds. And let me tell you something about King James. Um, he ascended the throne at the ripe old age of 13 months. Uh, his mother was Mary, Queen of Scots. She was forced to abdicate, and that's a whole sordid mess. We could do a whole study on that. It's very inter interesting. King James was the sixth, King James the sixth of Scotland, but eventually became King James the first of Ireland and England, and he was able to coalesce. He was able to bring all those uh, crowns together. And if you think they had gender identity problems today, that is King James there on the left as a small boy. I think that's a boy. <laughs> and that's him when he was 17 there in that luscious red outfit. So, <laughs> looks like women. And that's, that's his mother there, Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, she was in prison for 19 years. They never really had any sort of contact or relationship whatsoever. She ended up 19 years in prison. She ended up being beheaded for a, a number of uh, crimes, least of which is uh, trying to kill Queen Victoria. Again, so. Um, I've said it before. All great, moral fa all great failures are moral failures. So there's a woman there that could have been something or whatever, but there's moral failure after moral failure. 19 years in prison, finally got beheaded. All right, back to our timeline. Mash it hard, is that what you said? Oh, duh. falling apart here. All right. So back to our timeline. It's going to get a little bit busy up here, but um, as it applies to James, but we'll just work it out to me. So translation of the Bible remains the most famous legacy. James also approved the flag of Great Britain. Uh, he sponsored William Shakespeare as a playwright, uh, expanded trade with India, and was the namesake for the first permanent colony in our new world, Jamestown. I had forgotten all about that. That's a grade school history thing right there, right? Forgot all about that. So in 1604, King James assembled 54 guys, scholars, to undertake a new edition of the Bible. He wanted a Bible that the common man could read. 
They worked seven years at various locations, including Cambridge and Oxford. I was stunned to think that those places were in, still were there already in that time frame. And now we have the famous 1611 version um, that came about in seven years, which, have you ever tried to read and look? Have you ever looked at a 1611 version? It's almost impossible to read. We couldn't read it. We, we couldn't use it today. All right. Tyndale and Martin Luther. A standoff. So in 1517 and 1526, they would take Erasmus's translation, and I'll get to that in a second. They'd made translations for their people. So Luther went to the Germans. He wrote a German Bible and Tyndale in English. Uh, there in doing that, they committed crimes against the Catholic Church, and Tyndale paid for his with his life for that. Uh, in a conversation with Tyndale, a Catholic bishop said he respected the word of the Pope more than the word of the Bible. Uh, to this, Tyndale replied, "I defy the Pope and all its laws. If God spare my life, ere I will cause a boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the Scripture than you do." So, and it's interesting as I have a. Um, Catholic catechism on my desktop at home. I reference that because my family's still in there and have some degree of interest in that. But there's actually a spot in there that if, if scripture and the church have a conflict, the church wins. So they're putting the word of God, the word of man over scripture. It tells you where they're at, right? So for his crime of uh, putting together an English Bible in 1536, he was executed by the Catholic Church. His crime, giving the people an English Bible. The Catholic Church has to remain in control of the Latin Bible, and praise God, they have lost control of that, because that was what they wanted to do. That's where they kept control of people, was having the only Bible you could look at was the Latin Bible. And on his funeral pyre, not his funeral pyre, on his deathbed being burned up. Um, Tyndale said, God opened the eyes of the king of England, and God did. Therefore, we have the King James authorized version. So, again, thankfully they lost control of the, the Bible in that respect, the Latin Bible. Okay, now it's going to get real messy, but we'll unpack this. So the primary source of the King James Bible was Textus Receptus. That's over there in 1516. I wish this little thing would work. Not going to work. I broke it. So you just have to kind of follow along. Or was I? Okay, Texas Receptus, thank you. So, stop and think for a second. Um, the King James Version is rooted in a very small segment of manuscripts. It was primarily Texas Receptus from 1516. Again, he took um, those 47 guys and packed them away in a place, and they created the Bible. I have completely lost my place here. What does Texas Receptus mean? It means text received. I think this is a good question. <laughs> Thank you. It's in my notes right here. <laughs> Say again. Erasmus. Erasmus is a man, yes. Okay. He used that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Would you like to come up here and read my notes? <laughs> 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 So being that Greek was the language of the day, where Erasmus was, he was a scholar. Greek was the language of the day. Um, Byzantine, it was a Byzantine empire. They had an absolute landslide of documents that they could use to build King James Bible. Push the middle button really hard. It works. Oh, but really hard. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Mash it. All right, let me, I, I, I know this slide. So the King James Bible, 1611, 
built out from Texas Receptus, commissioned in 1604, completed in 1611. All the other Bibles on the other side are built with older documents. If you're a King James only fan, you've got to understand that your Bible was built under a Greek, doc, Greek documents under a very small. So you have an old timey Bible translated from newer scripture, 1516. Okay. These newer translations out here, American Standard Version, uh, first major American Re uh, version of King James, New American Standard Bible, all the ones that have the little yellow star on them, the little yellow highlight on them, those are all created from second, third, and fourth, and later documents. So the newer translations we have were created from older documents. King James which is what we call that, that stake in the ground for us. And we have some people who are King James only people that's created from a very narrow set of newer documents. Okay. That slide kind of makes sense at that point. I should stay away from my notes. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to leave the timeline, but we have to get some understanding now of how we get our Bible from all these uh, different documents into a cohesive Bible, okay? There's more than these that are required, but I've picked these because these are going to be what's required for us to be able to look at our Bible and say, does it add up? Does it follow these things? Does it fall in line with revelation, inspiration, canonicity, textual criticism, and the translations, okay? So revelation, words were spoken, to, words were spoken by God to someone, i.e. the prophets. Inspiration, the prophets wrote it down. Canonicity, Apply basic standards. Is it authoritative and prophetic? Textual criticism is the word I'm looking at in my Bible, the word that the writers used. And then translations. I didn't want to go through translations because translations is one of those really touchy subjects. Okay, translated directly from Hebrew, the Old Testament, and the Greek Testament. So. Sure, go ahead. Okay, we're going to go into that. Good question. <laughs> we're going to take them one at a time, all right? So we're going to go with the revelation. God commuting to man, which he would otherwise not know. God revealed through his prophets the thoughts into the prophets, the kings, judges, apostles, and others. I say others because I was looking at, like, we don't really know who wrote the book of Esther, right? All right? Subjectively, we would say that Paul wrote Hebrews, but we don't know that. Okay, so there are the others in there. True revelation from God is always objective. In other words, it's not influenced by personal feelings or objectives. The prophets didn't have to wait and see if it turned out or to see if the principles worked. They said, if this is what they're going to do, and they didn't wait around, well, I think I'll write this down, and I'll mail myself a letter so that I can go back five years later and say, look, I said it was going to happen. They didn't. They just stood on what it was. Inspiration. Here's a quote from Ryrie. Some of you might even have a Ryrie Bible in, right there on your lap. God's superintending of human authors so that using their own individual personalities, they compose and record it without error in the words of the original autographs, his revelation to man. All right, I'm, there's another word up there, autographs. I don't mean like autographs like this. An autograph in this context implies an original document. And I also might use the word extent. It's Called, uh, let's take it up. Existing. They use the word extent, but it's in extended. Um, you, you'll see it. I feel like Biden up here. <laughs> yeah. All right. So God using superintending the human authors. If they said such things as the spirit of the Lord spoke to me, thus says the Lord, or Paul said, for you know what commands we gave you through Lord Jesus, or I received from the Lord, or from John, the revelation of Jesus Christ, his bondservant. There's guys saying, so if you said, thus saith the Lord, you better be pretty confident that this is what the Lord told you. All right. There is one asterisk there. I received from the Lord. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11.23 real quick. We're not going to look at anything doctrinally, but this is one of those places where the Lord pretty much told me this is what you need to start looking at because you don't understand 
how you got your Bible. So, if you're new here, um, leadership kind of rotates through communion services. So, once every three or four months, each of us has to do a communion service. I've been trying to focus on communion services. And I came across this. I've used this verse before. Um, with me, 11.24, I'm going to go to first. It's a red letter Bible. It's a red letter verse. So I know Jesus said it, but I'm saying like, let's see, it's in the middle of Corinthians and it's red letter. So I guess it's there just for, to illuminate it. So you can say, okay, this is what Jesus said. So I'm poking around in subsequent studies and I say, why is that like that? So I go to look at the date that Corinthians was um, circulating, and it's well before any of the Gospels. So I said, okay, so why is that? How did Paul know that? So I guess he just texted John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and said, hey, what's the deal? What did Jesus really say on the Passover? Well, he didn't do that because I, that's when I went up to, and I, I, always had, I always tell everybody, read 20 verses up and 20 verses behind so you get context so you can go from there. I didn't do that myself because right there in verse 23, it says, I received from the Lord divine revelation, Jesus gave, the Holy Spirit gave him, take, eat this, my body, which is broken for you. He didn't have to get that from any of the other apostles. Okay. So that's not anything earth shattering. It's not pure. It's pure inspiration from Paul's perspective. But for me, it was one of the drivers that said, I've got to get a better handle on what's taking place because I'm losing context. I'm losing control. I'm losing the ability to be able to stand up here and say, this is what God said. One more what does superintending mean? Um, intended, if you will. God intended. It's a good question again. I tried to put the definitions here where I could. So inspiration, we talk about plenary. You've heard Pastor Ritt talk about plenary inspiration. Plenary is another word for absolute. We view scripture as a whole as being plenary. Every word, word form, word placement found in the Bible's original manuscript was divinely and intentionally written. So plenary means that all the parts of the Bible are equally of divine origin and equally authoritative. Verbal plenary inspiration applies to the original or the extant manuscripts of the, of the books of the Bible. Translations are trustworthy, but not divinely inspired. Okay. So plenary inspiration can only control, it can only apply to that which we have that we can say is an extant or an original autograph manuscript, okay? And we have some. We have some from the second, third, and fourth centuries. Erasmus, all that stuff, I'm going to step back a little bit because I should have said this, is we have a complete Bible from the fourth century. Complete. We have a um, Bible from the entire New Testament and half the Old Testament from the third century. And we have thousands upon thousands of small little scraps of paper here, written here and there, of other pieces of the Bible. And who, where would you think that the most complete Bible and oldest Bible resides? The Vatican. The Vatican. <laughs> they have it. They have a complete fourth century Bible. It's the oldest complete Bible on the face of the earth. So they have that. But again... The one from the, that's partially complete from the 3rd century wasn't found until the 19th century. So that's why Erasmus, they did, those, these guys who wrote the King James Bible, they didn't have the documentation to be able to go back like we have now. Canonicity. This is something that's really, really important for you to handle on because this is an area where people are going to challenge you. You need to understand canonicity. Canonicity is how did we get these were how do we get the Bibles, the 66 books that we have in here? Why are there only 66 and there's not 65 or there's 67? And why are they in the order that they're in? It's pretty easy to do if you start to unpack it, but it's one of those questions, especially if you're talking to Catholics. You heard of the Apocrypha? All right, they're big on the Apocrypha. You've got to be able to refute why it isn't in there. All right, so. The canon of scripture refers to all the books in the Christian Bible and Hebrew scriptures that together constitute the complete and divinely inspired word of God. 
Only the books of the canon are considered authoritative in matters of faith and practice. The most significant implication of a closed canon is that additional books cannot be added to the Bible, and none of the books that are currently included can be removed. God has spoken. All right. Nothing is going to get added or ever be taken away from our Bible. They may take our Bible, but they can't take what's in the Bible, and they can't take what's in our hearts and our minds, right? Uh, Actually, it was done in the um, Council of Trent, and I have to get the other one for you, but I know Council of Trent was uh, one of the, the main ones. Good question. I should have written that down. I should have you. Su- <laughs> Maybe we should submit questions for afterwards. All right. So how about the question is, how, okay, here, here's your criteria. Somebody was asking about that. The church used for recognizing and collecting the word of God as follows. Was the word, the, was the book written by a prophet of God? Was the writer authenticated by miracles to confirm his message? Does the book tell the truth about God with no falsehoods or contradictions? Does the book evident of the events or evidence, Mark, if you want to, does the book draw evidence of a divine capacity to transform lives? Was the book accepted as God's word by the people to whom it was first delivered? Um, The Catholic church tried to add the Apocrypha because the books that they wanted to added supported their positions that was anti-Luther. Does that make sense? Luther wanted to take them out of there because they didn't apply to what Luther said, by faith alone are we saved. So they looked, they, they have these, what, seven or eight other books that they've put in there. There's 15 books that are recognized as being apocrypha. And um, they are not recognized today. Yes, they are. I thought for a minute that was the trunk. I know. All right, so if you have these divinely inspired books, why are they arranged in the order that we have them in in our laps? It seems quite logical if you break them down like this. So we have the law, we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then we have the history books. Then we have the wisdom and the poetry books. Then we have the major prophets and the minor prophets, and they're not major and minor because they're better than the other guys, or it's basically, if it's a quantity of their work, Isaiah and Jeremiah did a ton of work as opposed to, let's say, Amos and Obadiah. All right, so major prophets, minor prophets. Then we have the gospels, we have church history, we have Paul's epistles, we have general epistles, and then we have prophetic or apocalyptic literature. So that's the way it's arranged in your Bible. And if you stop and think about it in that manner, it kind of makes sense the way they've been put together. Again, I got really tripped up on that first Corinthians because, again, we have this cadence we do. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans, Acts, first Corinthians. You know, we have a tendency to say, okay, well, that's, that's the way we do it. We do it. That's, that's the way they're put out there. That's not the way they're put out there. <laughs> So again, it's one of those drivers for me. Transmission. The ancient process of copying Hebrew and Greek manuscripts to to preserve them for future generations and distribute them for greater use. I want you to turn in your Bible, pick up your Bible, and go to the front of the Bible. It's probably going to be in the numeral, numeral... Roman numeral section. I just cannot talk. Might be in the names of the order of the books of the apostles. It's going to look like something like this. You there? Okay, so look at, do you have LXX? You don't have LXX? Okay. Um, do you have M or do you have NU? What Bibles do you guys have? Well, I'm a King James girl, so you know what's sitting in my lap. 
for LXX? Yes. yes. Okay. What the, that's the Roman numeral 70. The reason it's number 70 is because there were 70 guys, 70 scribes that worked on the, the, the go back, go to 1 Corinthians again. I'm only going to use this verse because we were already there. 1 Corinthians 11, 11, 24. If you don't have a study Bible, this is probably not going to... Anybody not have a study Bible in front of them? Just a regular Bible? Okay. So go to Romans... I mean, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians eleven twenty four, And here's an example for the word take. I have a little number one there. Do you have that? Okay. So if you look over on the right or left, whatever it is, and you see the number one on the margins, and it says one is and you, right? Okay, so then you go back to the abbreviations and you find out what is and you. All right, so those are important because then you can, it's going to tell you where your text came from. So if you have just an M, it's going to say you're going to be from the majority text. All right? Now, if you have, you're probably not going to have a lot of C's in the New King James Bible because it didn't, there aren't any real critical text in here, and we'll look at ma major and critical text in a minute. But LXX, those are the guys that did the Septuagint. Um, if you have VG, if you look in your special abbreviations markings, you have VG. There's Jerome's Latin Bible, so you can look up and see what translations came to, from the low. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Who said no? Okay, how can I help you? I, I don't even have L. LXX? Yeah, I don't have any. I don't think Pastor checks this. Do I have the wrong one? No. Okay. After service, we'll look at it. I'll show you what I'm talking about. But basically, the abbreviations are up there up front to tell you where your translation is coming from. Okay. Okay, that was a lot longer road than I went there. Do you have a TR? If you're looking at your abbreviations, do you have TR? Yeah. Texas Receptus. There you go. So there's, if, you're, if you see TR next to your verse or as a, a side note there, that translation that for that verse came from Texas Receptus. So maybe start focusing on some of that when you're doing your Bible studies rather than just reading it. All right. So you're going to find this next section kind of interesting. Materials. What did they use? Papyrus, made by pressing and gluing two layers of split papyrus reeds to form a sheet. They would use ve vellum, which was an animal skin, or parchment, which, which was sheep or a goat. Um, Old Testament scribes. The scribes were hyper systematic and careful about what they were doing. I'm going to show you a partial list of what they had to do as scribes. First of all, it had to be from an animal skin. Uh, from a clean animal, so you could see Leviticus if you wanted to see what a clean animal was. Each column, there was no less than 48 lines and no more than 60. The ink had to be black and formulated from a special recipe. You had to verbalize each word aloud as you wrote it. So can you imagine being in, in the room with four or five guys doing scribe work? <laughs> or 10 guys? All right. Check this out. You had to wipe the pen and wash your whole body before you wrote the word Yahweh. <laughs> Every, single Every single time. The document had to be reviewed by committee within 30 days, find mistakes. If there were as many as three pages that needed correction, the entire document was destroyed. <laughs> Letters and words and paragraphs had to be counted. So before you started uh, doing on a document, you had to count every letter, make note of it, every word, and every paragraph. And visually, when you copied it onto another document, it had to look like that. The document was invalid if two letters touched. <laughs> and the document had to be stored in a sacred place. Again, and, that, and that's just a partial list. But I imagine, I, just, I don't think I'd want to be a scribe. But it wasn't anybody who was a scribe. You were a, it was a calling, right? But that's how focused they were. As opposed to... The New Testament, okay, there's that number, LXX, the 70 scribes that worked on the Septuagint. They were not quite as 
careful. Their goal was to get as many extant copies created as quickly as they could and get into the libraries and get it into the hands of the people who are willing to pay for them. Because again, at this point, you could get documents because you had a higher degree of literacy in the area. So the more literacy they have, anybody who wanted could get one. The New Testament has been preserved in more manuscripts than any other ancient word, work. 5,800 complete or fragmented Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, 9,300 other languages. Compared to other format, formist writings of antiquity that most people believe or hold as being more reliable, a source of truth in scripture, look at these numbers. Plato, the oldest one we have that's even comes close to us, 1,200 years after he was born, we have seven copies. Caesar, 900 years later, 10 copies. Herodias, 1,300 years later, eight. Aristotle, 1,400 years later, we have five, five copies. The New Testament, from 35 to 100 years, we have 4,000 to 50,000 reference documents. Again, there's no question God has preserved his, his words. Remember I said uh, King James sponsored Shakespeare, the playwright? We do not have a single document in his handwriting. Catch that? Not a single document do we have that is in Shakespeare's hand. Indeed, some of them were not even completed by him, and some of them were written by other people, as suppositionally. But we don't have a single document. Oh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. We don't even know if he wrote it. Now, some people surmise he couldn't even write. He had to have other people do it for him. So, again. I wrote down here, just in my notes, ignorance keeps you bound in your unbeliefs. All right, which Greek manuscripts are best? Two schools of criticism. Um, if you looked at your Bible and you had your abbreviations, you would have had an M, majority text view, because that's what your King James would be primarily. If anybody here have NIV or ESB, NASB, or NIV? Okay, Michelle, I know you do. So you would have one that would probably have a CR for a critical text view, because that's what your Bible is uh, derived from. So critical text, critical text view are the oldest manuscripts are more accurate. The theory is that the older, oldest manuscripts are more significant, although they are a few. The majority text view is that the type of manuscripts that survived in greatest numbers are the most accurate, even if they are less ancient. <clears throat> so here's an example. If you're playing the telephone game, right, you want to be as close as you can to the original, right? <laughs> The other side of that is, if I have you two write down a copy, a copy, a 100-page book for me, the chances are you guys are going to make some mistakes, right? But if I have 10 people doing it, I can probably figure out what's going on. If I took 200 people and told them to copy this book exactly, even if there was a 1% or 2% error in all of them, we could lay out the entire 200 of them, and since the mistakes wouldn't generally fall into the same area, we could come back to a nearly original document. So that's why it's a good thing. There's two schools of thought. You either have close to the original, but very few, or you have a lot of manuscripts, but there's errors, but because there's so many of them, we can parse it down to what was originally said. You with me? All right. I just explained that. All right. These next three slides, if you were here last Christmas, this is a really good example of a textual variant. If you were here Christmas, um, Luke 2.14, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. It's a Christmas card. It's a great Christmas card. It's a great, great, great statement, right? Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. We don't have a lot of peace on earth, and there's not a lot of goodwill towards men. Men right now is, means men collectively. So that's what it says in King James. And if you took a modern Greek look at that, that's exactly what it would be in modern Greek. Uh, old Greek would be all capitals, and there would be like no spaces between the words. We wouldn't even be able to read it because we don't know how. But some of the older Greek manuscripts, like NIV, Michelle's actually has this, has this translation we're going to give you. So the oldest copies have this little letter here in the bottom. It's called a sigma. So... 
on the newer translations taken from the older documents, this sigma exists. From the King James Version area, era, we have a newer document on an older Bible, and it doesn't exist. So the majority text view on the top would be King James, and the bottom one would be critical text. But if you put it in, if it's there, if the sigma is there, it says something very different. So peace on earth, goodwill to men in whom he's well pleased. All right, that's a whole different subset of men who were pleased overall, peace on earth, goodwill towards men collectively, as opposed to peace on earth with men on whom he's well pleased. You would be what I would consider the well pleased. He's pleased with you. We have accepted him as our personal savior, okay? We have a relationship with him. I prefer the NIV or the NASB only because ESV and NLT have now gone gender neutral on us. So they don't use the word men anymore. So it's peace on earth among those with whom he is well pleased. All right, so you get me? Anybody get, not get what's going on here? So you have one missing letter, and it means some, something completely different. Now, that's really, really, really unusual in the Bible. There's tons of them where they're missing a punctuation mark, or they're missing a letter or a word, but rarely, rarely, rarely does it ever change what the meaning of the, word, uh, the uh, actual verse is. All right, so I have absolute confidence in what I hold is the word of God, and so should you. We have thousands of documents to compare to one another, which is far better than having a few. We've had thousands of scholarly individuals painstakingly perform comparative examinations of every word every phrase or aspect of a single document or books of the Bible. Technology via the internet has unearthed and correspondingly linked all manner of research and indeed brought to light thousands of previously unknown and rarely examined fragments of manuscripts. Critics will always, always be critics until the hand of God touches them and grants them the grace gift to believe. I know that because I was one and so were you. It's a transformative, life-breathing collection of documents. It's absolutely from the hand of God. There's no other book that when I read it, it will cause me to weep at times. Never, ever wept reading any other book. This is where we started. This is where we'll finish. Our Bible is persecution literature written by persecuted believers for the strengthening of our persecuted believers. So any questions? Otherwise, I'll just close in prayer. Any questions, comments, concerns? Roger? This is a comment, not a question. Uh, it might, be, you might find it interesting to know, I just came across this this afternoon, uh, Barna, in 2018, did a survey about which is the most read by your version. Uh, do you know what the answer to that is? King James? I use King James. I'm not, and, and I'm in no way advocating translate, a translation change. You use what you got. As a matter of fact, here's a little story. Pastor's in Panera. He's having a little fair. He's got his Bible out there. He's reading it. Some guy walks out, walks by him, and says, That better be the King James version you're reading. Pastor Ritz said, How about you just live the one you read? <laughs> so that's what you need to be doing. So, I mean, like I say, that whole textual variant thing that uh, I showed you about peace on earth, good will to men, that I have that, I took notes out of Michelle's Bible, you know, 10 years ago, and I finally had the audacity to pick up to figure out why that is like that. So that's how I ended up with that last year. So that's the second one. So those two things, the first Corinthians and that one, were the driver for me to be able to go through this study. And I'm still going through it, just trying to figure out, this Bible is so simple to read and understand the gospel 
But the other side, it is so complex and touches. It's just unbelievable. And the more you get into it, the more it actually becomes more exciting. For me, it is. I'm sort of a word nerd anyway, so I really like to play with the words, but it's just stunning. I have lots of different translations, and I use the Blue Letter Bible. If I'm going to do any research, it's quick and easy. But there's a ton of other free versions out there of things you can use. I really want to spend the money and get Logos. That's a really awesome program, but I think they want like 500 bucks for it. But it's pretty killer. But otherwise, no questions. We'll just close in prayer.